Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to your hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worldly magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Set us free, O oh God, from the bondage of our sins, and give us the liberty of that abundant life which you have made known to us in your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. In our first reading, the prophet Isaiah rebukes the people for fasting to serve their own interests, to make themselves noticed by God and their peers, rather than using the fast to reform their lives, to break the bonds of the oppressed, and to share their wealth with those who have little or nothing. Then, and only then, will the Lord answer their prayers. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Shout out, do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Announce to my people their rebellion, to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet day after day, they seek me and delight to know my ways, as if they were a nation that practiced righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. Why do we fast? But you do not see. We humble ourselves, do you not notice? Look. You serve your own interest on your fast day and oppress all your workers. Look, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and strike with a wicked fist. Such fasting as you do today will not make your voice heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose, a day to humble oneself? Is it to bow down the head like a bulrush and to lie in sackcloth and ashes? Will you call this a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I choose, to loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house, when you see the naked to cover them and not to hide yourself from your own kin? Then your light shall break forth like the dawn, 
and your healing shall spring up quickly. Your vindicator shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help, and he will say, Here I am. If you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness and your gloom will be like the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters never fail. Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to live in. The word of the Lord. Let us read responsively Psalm 112, verses 1 through 10. Hallelujah! Happy are they who fear the Lord and have great delight in his commandments. Their descendants will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches will be in their house, and their righteousness will last forever. Light shines in the darkness for the upright. The righteous are merciful and full of compassion. It is good for them to be generous in lending and to manage their affairs with justice, for they will never be shaken. The righteous will be kept in everlasting remembrance. They will not be afraid of any evil rumors. Their heart is right. They put their trust in the Lord. Their heart is established and will not shrink until they see their desire upon their enemies. They have given freely to the poor, and their righteousness stands fast forever they will hold up their head with honor. The wicked will see it and be angry. They will gnash their teeth and pine away. In this letter to the Christians in Corinth, Paul engages in a personal uh, reminiscence. He tells how he had tried to teach the gospel as a philosopher would, but to no avail. Now he must put aside his learned ways and reveal the secret wisdom of God, not, from the, not for the wise, but for the faithful. A reading from the first letter to the, to the Christians in Corinth. When I came to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come proclaiming the mystery of God to you in lofty words or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I came to you in, in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. My speech and my proclamation were not with plausible words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the spirit and the power, so that your faith might rest not on human wisdom, but on the power of God. Yet among the mature, we, we do speak wisdom, though it is not, not a wisdom of this age or of, the, or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to perish. But we speak God's wisdom, secret and hidden, which God decreed before the ages, before the ages for our glory. None of the rules of this age are underst un understand this, for if they, if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, What's, what, what no eyes have seen, nor ears heard, nor the human heart conceived, what God has prepared for, that, for those who love him, these, 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 these things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For what human, human being knows what is truly human except the human spirit that is within? So also no one comprehends what is, true, is truly God's except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit that is from God, 
so that we may understand the gifts bestowed on us by God. And we speak of these things in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual things to those who are, are spiritual. Those who are unspiritual do not receive the gifts of God's Spirit, for they are foolishness to them, and they are unable to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Those who are spirit, spiritually discern, the spiritually discern all things, and they are themselves subject to no one else's scrutiny. For who has, who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of, the, of, the, of Christ, the word of God, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Lord, Lord, you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, St. Stephen's. Good morning. How are you? As your bulletin says, I'm the Reverend Canon Patricia Mitchell, the Canon for Pastoral Care here in the Diocese of Long Island. And that means I work with Bishop Provenzano in his office, and I offer pastoral care to the clergy and, fam and their families of the diocese, and to retired clergy. I also uh, support the ministry of deacons here in the diocese, 
and then other di duties as assigned. So it's a pleasure for me to be here because of my position. Um, I am able at times to supply on a Sunday as I am today and to help out a parish or a priest that needs someone to come in. So I'm happy to be able to do that today and to see you. It's my first time here. It's a beautiful church and everyone's been very welcoming. So thank you. So for the past few weeks, we've been on a kind of journey with Jesus as we always do. Um, you've heard from his baptism to the beginning of his ministry. Last week, we had the Sermon on the Mount, his teaching to his disciples, and the Beatitudes, blessed are the meek, blessed are the poor, all those sort of countercultural things that he had to say. Because who wants to be poor, right? It's not really good to be meek, we think. And so he was introducing them, this first teacher was introducing them to the world of the kingdom and how things in the kingdom are often different from the world and from the culture of the world. So he was orienting them to the world of the kingdom and the world of the gospel and discipleship. And so he continues this morning, we have something about salt. Now, in our, in our modern life, we don't talk a lot about salt. I mean, we use it on our food, unless our doctor tells us to hold back because we have high blood pressure. Um, we think about salt when it's going to snow, and we hope that the guys get out on the, on the roads and salt them. Right? But salt is not a major feature of our life. But it was different in biblical times. Salt was a big deal back then. And so it's important to sort of understand that. It was important, an important part of their everyday life in biblical times. It was a chief economic product in the, in the um, ancient world. It was used for seasoning, which we understand, preserving. It was used in the anointing oil that they used. Infants were rubbed in it to ensure good health, and it was a key component in the covenant between God and Israel, the covenant of salt, which is described in the book of Numbers. So Jesus says to his disciples, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. Jesus used salt with them because they would know how important salt was. They would pay attention just as he, if he were here and used a metaphor for us that would make sense for our everyday life. Um, so he was saying that they are to be salt. And salt is never complete in and of itself. I mean, it's an ingredient, but it does something to the whole. It's meant to cause an effect. It's, mean to, it's, mean, it's meant to change things. And my grandmother would say it kicks up the flavor, but it's meant to enliven things, right? To keep, keep away from blandness. And so Jesus was telling disciples about what they were to be like, to be like salt in the, country, in the culture around them. It was to wake people up, to create something different. And so in talking to disciples, he was talking to us also, the church, the body of Christ, that we are called to be the same thing. We're called to participate in society as we do every day, but in a way that provides distinctiveness and influence that changes things. things. Life should be changed because we're in it. We're called to a special relationship with the world, to be in it, but also to do something different within it. Otherwise, we will not be good for anything like salt that has lost its flavor. But unfortunately, sometimes the church has and continues to fail to take a differentiated stance, if you would, if you would a particular kind of stance against the culture call things out, to call things out, to call people to something different. And the church has struggled with that and continues to struggle with that. Church Universal, and in particular, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Episcopal Church. And because this is Black History Month, it provides an opportunity to look now at how our branch, the Episcopal branch of the Jesus Movement, as the presiding bishop calls it, how it has at times failed to take up a differentiated stance around racial relations has failed to be salt in this particular area. From the time of the Civil War through the Civil Rights era and on today, our church has faced a dilemma because on the one hand it says everyone is created in God's image, we are all God's children, we believe in human equality, but on the other hand there is how blacks have been treated in the church, in society, as well as in the church in general and the Episcopal Church in particular. 
on the one hand, the church declared that we were all children. On the other hand, African Americans were treated often as other. And it's a recurring motif if you look at the history of our church about how this has happened. And it's chronicled in a very wonderful book um, written probably about 40 years ago, perhaps, called Yet With a Steady Beat. It's written by Reverend Dr. Harold Lewis, who just died last year. But it's a really rich history of the Episcopal Church and the lives of black people. And so I just wanted to spend a little time about this because this coming a week from tomorrow, on February 13th, we will celebrate the life and ministry of Absalom Jones. You may be familiar, or you may not be familiar, he's in our liturgical calendar. But Absalom Jones was the first African-American priest ordained in the Episcopal Church. He was ordained on September 21st, 1802. And I know that date because exactly 200 years later, on September 21st, 2002, I was ordained a priest. So I will always remember when Absalom Jones was ordained a priest. But it took him a long time to get to that. A lot of struggle, which I won't detail now. Um, but his struggle to get to ordination is a, a sort of a history of how black people have struggled in this church. He was born a slave in 1746 and eventually purchased his freedom. And after many years of obstacles, was ordained. And then when he had a congregation, they sought, this was in, this was in Pennsylvania, in Philadelphia. That congregation sought to join, when it started, sought to join the Diocese of Pennsylvania. Just as you are part of the Diocese of Long Island, it wanted to join the Diocese of Pennsylvania because it was a congregation. However, the Diocese of Pennsylvania failed to be sought. What they did is they guaranteed them affiliate status. Like, you all stay over here, we're over here. You're not really part of us, you're an affiliate. And it took years, six years, before St. Thomas Church was granted membership, full membership in the Diocese of Pennsylvania. And today, in fact, right now, the presiding bishop is preaching at that church on Absalom Jones. But the African Episcopal Church of St. Thomas is a well-known and vibrant congregation in the Diocese of Pennsylvania. But it was unfortunately the church, the Episcopal Church and the Diocese of Pennsylvania failed to be sought. They failed, in this instance, to take a stance against the prevailing culture, the culture which said, you people stay over there. We don't really want you with us. To say, no, you are with us, and we will stand for you. It went along to get along. You ever heard that phrase, go along to get along, like don't rock the boat? Because it's easier sometimes to go along to get along in the short term. Usually in the long term, it doesn't work out. You're avoiding an issue. But that was the culture. So then that was what our church did. But that luxury no longer exists. I mean, and the Episcopal Church has struggled, just as other churches have, to be salt in other areas of life, too, in other areas of endeavor. But that luxury of going along to get along doesn't exist. It never really existed for the church, but the church really has many times not stepped up to the plate for what it has to do, for what it needs to respond to. But with so many things facing our society and our culture, we really do not have the luxury of going along to get along. We have Yes, racial discrimination in our society. We are not in a post-racial society. But we also have poverty and hunger. We have immigration issues. We have voter suppression. We have intolerance. We have police brutality. We have the pandemic. We have bullying. We have the school to prison pipeline, climate change, economic stress. We have political dysfunction. And that's not an exhaustive list. You can probably think of some other things I didn't mention. But, we, but there are a lot of things. There are a lot, there's a lot of stuff. It's a lot, as people say. But if you think of us, we're the church, and we're a, a container. We're the container. This is a container in which we are formed, right, in which we grow up. So think of it as a giant salt shaker, if we're all going to be salt, and that we are thousands of grains of salt, and that we're meant to be shaken out, right, to add salt to the mix. If we fail to do that, if we fail to add that special thing to our common life, then we have failed to live up to our call from Jesus. We've failed to be the substance that makes a difference and that rescues the society from its blandness or even from its evil, and that we have just settled into convenience and complacency and the status quo. Being salt is the nature of Christian discipleship. It's the church's ministry, it's, it's imperative to, to proclaim and live out the gospel of Jesus Christ, 
declare that Christ is Lord, that the kingdom has come, and to manifest that in the face and over against what the culture would say, or how the culture would try to negate that message. It's meant to serve, the church is meant to serve a critical function, and it's meant to be unlike any other institution in society. If we are doing our job, we should not be like the Rotary Club, or your fraternity, or your women's group. We're supposed to be something different. But it takes courage and effort and risking failure to do that. Douglas Hare, a theologian, has said, any church that adapts itself so completely to the secular world around it that its distinctive calling is forgotten has rendered itself useless. Or in the words of this morning's gospel, is to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. When the church steps up, when we as disciples live into our call, that's when the light that's also mentioned in the gospel shines for all to see. That's the other part of Jesus' message. There's the salt and the light. And that's what the church has to show. But you have to be salt before the light can be seen. You have to do something different so that then people can see what it is you're doing. And when we do that, then we're living in time ministry. So better, for better or worse, we're presented with numerous opportunities in our co common life in this day and age to show who we are, to show that we're living up to the mandate to seek out justice and to work for peace and to care for each other. Whenever we renew our baptismal covenant, as we do at an Easter vigil and other times when you have a baptism, we promise to persevere in resisting evil, to proclaim the good news of God in Christ, to seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving our neighbors as ourselves, to strive for justice and peace among all people, and to respect the dignity of every human being. You can't do that if you go along to get along. You have to rustle some feathers, ruffle some feathers. There's a phrase that I heard some time ago that highlights the church, the church's choice. Um, I came originally from the Diocese of New York, and we had a suffragan bishop there, Bishop Walter Dennis, who was a very famous preacher and orator, and, and the um, origin of lots of um, very pithy statements, but very crucial statements. And he, he preached in the 1977 General Convention, the big convention of the whole church. And he warned the church against becoming, of the danger of becoming a chaplain to the status quo. Think about that. What does a chaplain do? A chaplain nurtures someone, right? Say, oh, that's going to be OK. You're going to be fine. Chaplain to the status quo. It's not the kind of chaplain you want to be. You're going to be chaplain to anything. Of becoming chaplain to the status quo by failing to deal with the important issues and addressing them and calling them out. It's easier to be chaplain to the status quo in the short term than to challenge the prevailing culture. But there's a price to pay for that. And the price is nothing changes and things don't get better. It is said that in the Chinese language that the symbol for crisis is, can be interpreted as danger or opportunity. And I think in many ways we are we, we're confronting many crises in our common life. And so that if crisis presents danger and opportunity, the danger that we face is just to be the chaplain to the status quo, to do nothing, to go along, to get along. The opportunity is to take the risk to be salt and therefore to shed light on our life and what needs to happen. It is a difficult choice, but it is the choice that we have as Christians if we are to follow our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Theologian Howard Thurman said, the movement of the Spirit of God in the hearts of men and women often calls them to act against the spirit of their time or causes them to anticipate a spirit which is yet in the making. And so my brothers and sisters in Christ, my brothers and sisters of St. Stephen's, if the church is to shine, if it is to be the light of the world, it must first be salt. Whatever and wherever conditions and circumstances diminish the lives of God's children, keeping them from being what their creator meant for them to be, whenever and wherever God's children are marginalized, discriminated against, whenever and wherever the spirits of God's children are oppressed, or where God's children cannot flourish. We have the opportunity and the obligation to be salt, sprinkled here and there where we are, wherever we find ourselves, 
to speak up, to act, to be what blesses and preserves what's good and that fights the blandness of the status quo. And so what is God's call to you, this community, here? What are you being called to, St. Stephen's? How can you be salt and light to the people of God in this part of the vineyard? There is a lot to do in the name of the one who promised to be with us to the end of the age. And I say it's time to get shaken. <laughs> Amen. Please stand and let's affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, only in the Father. Through him all things are made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate for the Virgin Mary, his main man. For our sake, he was crucified and Pontius Pilate. He suffered and death was buried. On the third day, he rose again, according to the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and the Father. You come again to judge the living and the dead, and this kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Father of life, proceeds with the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified, and is spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy God, the apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead. The life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, hear our prayer. prayer. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, hear our prayer. prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them to the joy of your salvation. Today we pray especially for Hank, Peter, Bob, Mark, Pam, MB, Marion, Clay, Kai, Frank, Mark, Michael, Kimberly, Tina, Carol, Sue D, Todd, Einstein, Danny M, Pamela, Nat and Nancy, Jude, Sue B, Elsie, Sue M, Sally, MC, David, Jerry, Bruce, Pearl, Katie, James, Paul, Dawn, Macy, Mother Lauren, Roy, Bruno, Doug, Carol, Alan Michael, Leah, Ryan, Michelle, those suffering as a result of natural and human-made disasters, those injured due to gun violence, and all those affected by COVID-19. We also pray for our frontline workers, Dr. Elizabeth Engelman, Dr. Dan Griffin, 
Dr. Esther Knapp, Dr. Rachel Simpson, Karen Liu, Eva Longmeyer, Brenda Marshall, Susan Dietz Massengill, Kat Bates, Norena Guerra, and those responding to natural and human made disasters. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, hear our prayer. prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died. Remember especially Tyre Nichols, those who have perished so far in the war in Ukraine, those who died as a result of natural and human made disasters, those killed as a result of gun violence, the millions worldwide who have died from COVID-19, and those we remember in the silence, stillness of our hearts. May they rest in peace, and may your will for them be fulfilled, and we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, hear our prayer. prayer. O Lord our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people. In the multitude of your mercies, look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O lover of souls, and to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done, by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. We may do that. We will walk in your way. Lord, your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Please stand. My sisters and brothers, the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Peace. 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 Now is the time for announcements. Are there any announcements this morning? No? Okay. Do we have any birthday boys and girls? Oh, there's a birthday? Karen Mead? Lee? Okay. Another birthday? All right. Okay. Watch over those who are celebrating their birthdays, O oh Lord, as their days increase. Bless and guide them wherever they may be. Strengthen them when they stand. Comfort them when discouraged or sorrowful. Raise them up if they fall. And in their hearts, may your peace, which passes understanding, abide all the days of their life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you. Yes. Congratulations. Happy birthday. Do we have any anniversaries? That's all? No? Okay. Or well, people might have forgotten. <laughs> when I do, sometimes I do that and I ask, then I always ask the, the man in the room, what number is it? <laughs> they hate me for that. <laughs> yes. Okay. That's when I'm being naughty. That's all. All right, well then. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God.
flowers on the altar today are given to the glory of God and in loving memory of Lillian Irene Christofferson Moo by Mother Lauren. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere Give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, for you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. And gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we have fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. gifts of God for the people of God, take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. a couple of salvation. Light of Christ, the bread of heaven. Light of Christ, the bread of heaven. Like a blessing. Blessing of God, Almighty Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be upon you, the name of you all of us. Light of Christ, the bread of heaven. 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 Blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be upon you, the name of you all of us. Blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be upon you. Light of Christ, the bread of heaven. Light of Christ, the cup of salvation. Light of Christ, the bread of heaven. Light of Christ, the cup of salvation. Light of Christ, the bread of heaven. 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 Christ, 
better cut it. Oh, you know what? I think I gave it away. Okay. Okay, just a minute. I think I gave it away. All right. I had it. She's going to get it for you. Yes. Sorry. Butter Christ, the bread of heaven. Let us pray. God of abundance, you have fed us with the bread of life and cup of salvation. You have united us with Christ and one another. You have made us one with all your people in heaven and earth. And now send us forth in the power of your spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue wherever is risen life, Christ our Savior. Amen. Before I give the final blessing, I was asked to remind you that there will be coffee hour immediately following the service. All right. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of the Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always.
And brothers and sisters, let us go forth in the name of Christ.